I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at 14-6 as the Allies win the war. Some of the key objectives that we'll have as we move into 14-6 is we'll take a look at the D-Day invasion or the invasion of Normandy. We'll take a look at how the Allies achieved final victory in Europe. We'll explore the reasons President Truman decided to use an atomic bomb on Japan, not just one, but two atomic bombs. Okay, take a look at question one. Who were the big three leaders of the Allies? Well, for the majority of the war, you would have the United States President Franklin Roosevelt pictured in the center. To the left of the photograph, to the right of Roosevelt, is Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister. And to the far right of the screen and to Roosevelt's left, that is Soviet leader wearing his military hat and dress, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. So when you look here, what is the central idea of the joint statement from the big three at the Tehran conference? We're giving into the pressures of Stalin, the United States, and Great Britain agreed to open up the fight in the Western Front, which would be in France in hopes of taking some pressure off of the Eastern Front and on Stalin. Next, we'll move on to the invasion of Normandy Beach in France. Why, uh, what did the Allies do to make sure the D-Day invasion would be successful? Give some specific examples. Well, they didn't leave much, leave much up for chance. It was one of the most uh, well-planned out invasions in the history of warfare. They trained, drilled, prepared for many, many weeks on end. It was under the supervision and guidance of General Dwight David Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, the future President of the United States of America from 1953 to 1961. In order to deceive the Germans, the United States set up a phony or fictional army under Patton's command that was supposed to invade at a different location. Before the invasion, more than 11,000 planes destroyed German communications and transportation networks, which weakened their defenses on the beaches. They had a secret name or code name for the D-Day invasion, Operation Overlord. Dwight Eisenhower looked at all variables when deciding where and when to invade. He eventually decided to invade and attack at Normandy Beach, France. He's going to attack somewhere in the early weeks of June 1944. He had to consult weather forecasts, the tides, because conditions needed to be just perfect for what is an amphibious invasion of Normandy Beach. And by amphibious, we mean they're coming across the English Channel and the soldiers have to wade through the waters along the beaches in order to come ashore. Six is just about the sheer the, the statistics, the sheer numbers at Normandy Beach. The troops, the ships, the planes. You had 4,400 ships, 11,000 planes, transporting over 100,000 men, including 21 American divisions and 26 British and Canadian and Polish divisions. So sometimes we just think of the United States at D-Day, but there's a lot of heroic achievements here beyond just the American soldiers who fought at D-Day. It's important to be familiar with the exact date of the invasion, which is June 6th, 1944. Eisenhower invaded a 60 mile stretch of beaches, focusing in on Normandy Beach in France. The 
you look at the different colors there, it gives you the different groups who invaded Normandy Beach. American, British, Canadian, a little bit of support from Poland. You can see this is the location where the Germans most heavily defended the shores, thinking the attack would come in this region here. Think for a moment before I tell you, why would the Germans naturally think the Allies would attack along that particular area of beaches? Well, the primary reason why they thought this was the case is the most narrow stretch of water that separates the English Channel and mainland Western Europe. So they heavily defended this area here, but instead they went along a more, much wider path. And even if you look here, some of the blue stretches here, very long path that they had across. Another reason why the Germans were caught by surprise, in addition to their anticipation that it would be the attack would be along the Strait of Dover. The weather had been so bad in early June that the top general for the Germans, General Erwin Rommel, he went home for his wife's birthday, and Hitler kind of held that against Rommel at that point in time. In fact, uh, there were some rumors that his bad decision there to go to his wife's birthday nearly cost him his life at that point in time and some thought that Hitler was going to demand that he report to Hitler and he was going to have him executed. Rommel was certain in his mind and he reported back to the high level commanders that uh, the invasion was not going to occur, occur quite yet. Rommel also believed in what was known as the Atlantic Wall. To guard against an Allied invasion of Europe, Hitler ordered the laying of a uh, laying of millions of mines and miles of barbed wire and poured tons of concrete to create a defensive barrier along the west coast of Europe. The plan was a sham because the Germans did not know exactly where an invasion would occur. Yet it cost many Allied soldiers in their lives to secure the beach uh, beaches at Normandy. Nine, how many casualties did the Allies sustain during the D-Day invasion? Over 10,000 casualties. Despite the high casualty numbers, all beaches were secure by the end of the day on June 6, 1944. Over the next three weeks, the Allies landed more than a million troops and tons of equipment, food, and supplies in Normandy. You look at those two images there, one's a photograph and one is a drawing or an illustration. Kind of look at the differences there. The illustration on the right is kind of the idealistic approach to the D-Day invasion, what they had hoped would happen. On the left side is a photograph, which is the reality. You had uh, the soldiers wading out into that water, you know, waist deep water with heavy equipment on them. Many of them got gunned down before they even reached the beach. The terrain, though, you could see in the illustration, the high positioning that the Germans had. Photograph also illustrates the size, the sheer numbers of the Allied troops who landed at the beaches on D-Day. Next question 11, we're going to interpret a quote from Jack Fox. He was there on the D-Day invasion. I remember the bullets flying over our craft as we ran onto the beach despite enemy fire, which is clear from the ricochets of bullets hitting the water. I thought I was going to either drown or be shot before reaching the beach. So a lot of these soldiers are very pessimistic the moment they got off the amphibious landing craft here. They didn't think they had a good chance of living. Fox was part of an infantry force that invaded one of the one of Normandy's beaches. He had to go through relatively deep water. 
He survived difficult odds, reached the beach, and we were able to have this quote from him to kind of live on in history. Had he died before reaching the beach or he was gunned down before obviously being interviewed after the war, uh, we would not have this quote that's attributed to him. the defeat of Germany. So basically what happened is after the D-Day invasion, the American troops and the Allies began pushing back further and further into France. Eventually they pushed into Belgium and eventually they're going to move towards Germany. With the goal of the Allies pushing from the Western Front east towards Berlin. On the other end of Europe, the Soviet Union was pushing the German forces from the east westward. So it was kind of like a vice kind of eventually strangling out and crushing the Germans. Well, what had happened by August of 1944, American and free French forces had liberated Paris. A provisional government was set up under free French leader Charles de Gaulle. By mid-September, the Allies had control of most of France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Luxembourg, of course, being a tiny country that borders basically uh, that region near like uh, France and Belgium. 13 out of the D-Day invasion and then the Allied invasion of France impact Germany's strategy during World War II. After D-Day, Germany had to face a two-front war. They tried to defend their land against the huge Allied force coming from France and the Soviet army was advancing from the east. Caught between two powerful Allied forces, German troops had to keep retreating. 14, what was the military significance of the Battle of the Bulge? This was Hitler's last desperate, desperate offensive effort. So let me just kind of point out on the map here. So basically for a long period of time, the Germans were lined up, if you can see my arrow moving in a straight line, kind of defending Germany. But they were becoming outnumbered in terms of troops. They were undersupplied and were really in a desperate situation. So instead of continuing to try and defend straight up the German border, they instead concentrated all their troops in one area and pushed through the Allied line temporarily into Belgium at the Battle of the Bulge, pushing all the way back, maybe like 50 miles into Allied territory. What the Allies had to do then is they had to reflank their troops. So the American troops and Allied troops, which were pushed around by the Germans during the Battle of the Bulge, they doubled back in both directions, reorganized themselves, and then eventually they would turn around the Battle of the Bulge. This is like the last desperate effort by the Germans during the war. German success was short-lived, and after a couple of weeks, German forces were driven back towards Berlin. After this battle, the Allies steadily pushed German forces back into Germany. Fifteen, what happened on April 12, 1945? Sadly, Franklin Roosevelt, the American president during the Great Depression and for much of World War II, died of a cerebral hemorrhage. The vice pre president of the United States, Harry S. Truman, took over as president. Unfortunately for Franklin Roosevelt, he was so close to overseeing the end of World War II, maybe five months away from seeing the absolute end of the war, he died of natural causes. You can see the newspaper headline, President Dies Suddenly. While well, President Truman is being sworn in as president, you can see the headline underneath Truman, tanks are surging towards Berlin. Harry Truman was a little bit overwhelmed as he was sworn in as president. He was from a small town in Missouri. He had only been in his first term as senator when he became the vice presidential nominee and ultimately the vice president. Truman did not really have time to adjust to being president. He was immediately faced with some of the most difficult decisions in the history of the United States and the history of the world. What happened in, uh, to Germany in April 1945? 
Allied forces moving towards Berlin from the west, while at the same time the Soviet Union are pushing from the east. Both armies are very close to capturing Berlin. Hitler's quickly realizing that his days are numbered. Meanwhile, in Italy, Mussolini was pretty much finished himself. You can see here an angry Italian mob of resistance fighters were able to eventually capture Benito Mussolini. He was hanged for his crimes against the country. He, along with his loyal followers and his mistress. Unfortunately for Mussolini, killing him was not enough for the Italian citizens. They were so angry at Mussolini that you can see his body being basically hanged upside down there. They dragged his bodies down. They dragged his bodies through the street. This gave regular everyday Italian citizens the opportunity to kick, spit, whatever they could do to degrade or disgrace the dead body of Mussolini and his supporters. Very sad way to go. Hitler, being a good student of history for the most part, was seeing what was happening to his friend and ally Benito Mussolini. So on April 30th, 1945, Adolf Hitler, after poisoning his dog and getting his mistress, Eva Braun, who was just recently wedded to him, a cyanide caplet. His dog and wife were dead. He poisoned himself as well. And the brutal period of time in world history with Hitler at the controls of Nazi Germany had finally come to an end. Some of the readings that you've done in the textbook put forth the idea that Hitler had some mental instability in his background. You look at some of the decisions he made, including continuing to fight, even if it was clear the Allies were going to defeat him. He continued to sacrifice both German treasury and German lives. Hitler did not accept any compromises. He was convinced Germany would eventually emerge triumphant. Of course, he was wrong. A group of his own loyal men, including his leading general, Erwin Rommel, tried to convince Hitler to give up. And when that didn't work, they tried to overthrow him. His headquarters were bombed. In the end, Hitler became addicted to drugs and committed suicide. Roughly a week after Hitler's death, the head of the German military agreed to unconditional surrender on May 7th, 1945. That date, May 7th, 1945, is remembered as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. You can see the headlines, the war in Europe is ended. Surrender is unconditional. Victory in Europe Day will be proclaimed today. American troops are on the gain, on the move in Okinawa, which is an island in the Pacific, as the United States is moving towards mainland Japan. So another front's wrapped up. Twenty-two. What strategy did the United States devise for the Pacific Front? They came up with a two-pronged strategy developed for the Pacific that involved island hopping. Island hopping would mean you would secure one island, move on to the next. Sometimes you would skip an island and just move on to the one after that. So you would kind of have a strategy of taking control, securing an island, and moving on to another one. Admiral Nimitz, he would advance through the Central Pacific by hopping from one island to the next, moving eventually towards mainland Japan. Meanwhile, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, would advance through the Solomon Islands and eventually land an invasion of the Philippines to try and free and liberate those who were imprisoned during that period of time. See some of the different islands. You mentioned the Marshall Islands. There's Hawaii, Midway, Solomon. We have the Philippines. 
Japan. Twenty-three. How did the Navajo Native Americans impact the war in the Pacific? One of the biggest issues they had during this period of time was the secure communications of orders from American forces to each other. So during this period of time, very few citizens, very few citizens can speak native Navajo language. So when you look at the native Navajo language, there's a situation where uh, that was probably the more secure means of communication and any codes they could potentially come up with because there's only 28 non-Navajo people on the planet who spoke the language. They knew their native tongue was a greater means of secret communications and any codes they could come up with. 24, what happened in the Philippines in October 1944? Central Pacific Forces under Admiral Nimitz and the Southern Pacific under General MacArthur converged in the Philippines. As MacArthur and his forces stormed the island, MacArthur proclaimed, I have returned, rally to me. You remember when he had a retreat initially in defeat, he promised his military and the Philippine, Filipino people, he said, I shall return. And indeed he did. MacArthur did return to the Philippines. In March of 1945, the Americans and the Filipino allies captured the war-torn Philippine capital of Manila. It was a, thrill, a thriller in Manila. The Philippines were once again ours. American forces had taken control of the Pacific and were slowly but surely moving towards Japan. They set their target on Iwo Jima as well. Admiral Nimitz of the United States wanted to use the island of Iwo Jima as an airfield and bomber base to strike at Tokyo. The idea was to take off from Iwo Jima, use B-29 bombers to bomb Japan, and then refuel on Iwo Jima and continue to, to repeat that process on a nightly basis. In a bloody six-week battle that cost 23,000 casualties, nearly 7,000 dead American. The United States finally secured the eight-mile, eight-square-mile island. They had a similar difficult time at the Battle of Okinawa, another Pacific island. Okinawa was thought to be the final stepping stone to Japan. This is when the Japanese became really desperate, and they began using a desperate tactic, which was kamikaze pilots. Kamikaze pilots were suicide bombers. Basically, they would crash their planes into targets. Both sides knew if the Americans won the battle, the war would mostly, most likely move to the Japanese mainland. The two-month struggle saw the United States suffer 25,000 casualties, while the Japanese had more than 100,000 killed in this battle alone. When you look at the Japanese during this period of time, they were on desperate mode. When you look at 27, why did the fighting in the Pacific result in so many casualties for the United States? Well, the Japanese just did not give up. So when you're dealing with a difficult situation like that, it's almost impossible to efficiently get through a battle. You're losing many more lives than you probably had anticipated. The kamikaze pilots were doing a tremendous amount of damage. Additionally, the terrain itself was unfamiliar to many American soldiers, and the Japanese also fought from some of the underground shelters they had built to secure the island. is partially based here on the imagery of the destruction of Tokyo. You notice here a lot of the buildings are basically destroyed. There's some few, a few that are still standing, but generally speaking, much of Tokyo had la uh, laid in ruins. Tokyo was almost completely leveled. Americans believe that the widespread devastation there would hurt the Japanese war effort, their morale, and eventually force them to surrender. Unfortunately, they did not surrender quickly. The United States have been working on a secret plan or a project, the Manhattan Project, which was the code name for the development of the atomic bomb. It was put into place by Franklin Roosevelt. And it was so secretive that even when uh, Harry Truman was elected vice president, Franklin Roosevelt refused to share, 
refused to share the um, plan with uh, Truman. He kept it secret from his own vice president, the development of the atomic bomb. We were testing bombs in the deserts and on some uninhabited islands in the Pacific. Once the atom atomic bomb was developed and Truman found out about it, he had some options to consider about how to finally end the war in Japan and in the Pacific. He could continue to bomb Japan on a nightly basis and hope eventually they would surrender. He could wage traditional war, invade Japan, an estimated cost of one million American lives lost and billions and billions of dollars. Or he could use a new atomic bomb, avoid a costly ground invasion. The consequences of using the atomic bomb, this is just an estimate, 50 to 100,000 Japanese civilians would instantaneously lose their lives. Thousands of others would lose their lives in the aftermath from the fallout from the atomic bomb or from atomic poisoning. You see a detonation or explosion there in the picture at the top. President Truman, he decided, and he was quoted as saying, I regarded the atomic bomb as a military weapon and never had any doubt that it should be used. He did give the Japanese an ultimatum, kind of a warning, surrender before August the 3rd, 1945, or face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese ignored the ultimatum. You can see here the team below. The Enola Gay was the plane that would carry the first atomic bomb. The picture of the bombs there on the right side there. They even wrote like messages for the Japanese on the bomb. Not that they would get to see those messages. At precisely 8.15 a.m. on the morning of August the 6th, 1945, a B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay, dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, the site of numerous war plants and a major assembly point for convoys. So a lot of their military equipment was manufactured there. Most thought that Japan's will to go on would be weak after the bombing of Hiroshima. What were the results of the bombing? At ground zero of the explosion, the temperature reached a 540,000 degree Fahrenheit temperature. The explosion killed about 80,000 people instantaneously, while another 40,000 died from it later on. Some survivors were so badly maimed and burned by it, as you can see the back of the person on the far right side there, very disturbing to see. You see the left side there is basically the city afterwards. Hiroshima wiped out. It's the headline of the newspaper. Fortunately, the Japanese refused to surrender. So after the Japanese did not surrender after the first atomic bomb dropping on August the 9th, 1945, the United States dropped the second atomic bomb in Japan. This one at the shipbuilding center of Nagasaki. The city there, too, was destroyed. Around 70,000 people died at Nagasaki. Finally, the Japanese gave in and agreed to an armistice or a terms of surrender on August the 15th, 1945. That date is remembered as VJ Day or Victory in Japan Day. Next is a quote from somebody who witnessed the atomic bomb detonation. After I noticed the flash, white clouds spread over the blue sky. It was amazing. It was as if a blue morning glory had suddenly bloomed up in the sky. Then came the heat wave. It was very, very hot. Even though there was a window glass in front of me, I felt it felt hot. It was as if I was looking directly into a kitchen oven. That's how hot it was for uh, Seyo Kita, a Hiroshima witness. 38 described the power of the atomic bomb. You could use Kita's quote in the, and Photograph the explosion to support your answer. We had the photograph a little bit higher up. Atomic bomb created an enormous blast that was overwhelmingly destructive and powerful. Kita describes the rapid spread of the clouds, followed by a very hot wave of heat and felt even through a window. Kita said it felt as if I was looking directly into a kitchen oven. The bomb killed 100,000 people immediately, and many people later on died from the radiation poisoning. Next, the lesson reflection. When is the cost of victory too high? What factors should a president take into consideration prior to using a nuclear bomb or atomic bomb in another country? 
If the United States is attacked, you must defend. If the United States or a close ally is threatened, to protect American economic interests. So there are different reasons or rationales behind using a bomb to protect. However, using of a atomic bomb or a nuclear bomb should be avoided at all costs. Take a moment to get down to anything you need to for the final few questions or the lesson reflection. Remember, you can pause the video whenever you wish if you need additional time. But for now, that concludes our look at 14.6. It also concludes American involvement in World War II. One of the most devastating wars in the history of the world has come to an end. Speaking of an end, our discussion for now has also come to an end. So until next time, Mr. Clark is out.